Why don't you get me a paper towel or something? Dip it in some cold water. Right away, I'll even wipe it off for you. You don't want to lick it? Hello to all the classic people that are returning. I'm glad you're back. I want to welcome any new visitors. As a technical note, references and citations are listed for each show on the site at classicmoviereb.com. Today on the Classic Movie Reviews podcast, we are taking on Body Heat 1981. This movie is one of the best neo-noirs ever. It has been immortalized in a song by none other than Jimmy Buffett in the song Frank and Lola 1985. Quote, so he took her to this movie called Body Heat. She said the junior mints were mushy and the sex was neat, unquote. The film is a quality, uncredited rehash of Double Indemnity 1944. IMDb.com has this movie at a pretty low 7.4. RottenTomatoes.com has it ranked somewhat better, with 98% on the tomato meter and 81% audience approval. In a mostly positive review, the great film critic Roger Ebert said, quote, the last scene that works as a drama is the one where Ned suggests to Maddie that she go get the slices in the boathouse, and then she pauses on the lawn to tell him, Ned, whatever you think, I really do love you. Does she? That's what makes this movie so intriguing. Does he love her for that matter? Or is he swept away by sexual intoxication, body heat? You watch the movie the first time from his point of view, and the second time from hers. Every scene plays two ways. Body Heat is good enough to make film noir play like we haven't seen it before, unquote. New York Times film critic Vincent Canby really liked the film, stating in an October 25, 1981 review, quote, With Body Heat, the steamiest, most thoroughly satisfying melodrama about love, lust, and greed to be seen since Billy Wilder's Double Indemnity and Tay Garnett's The Postman Always Rings Twice. Forget about this year's lethargic remake. Lawrence Kasdan, heretofore known as a screenwriter for Raiders of the Lost Ark, Continental Divide, suddenly emerges as a member of the American directing elite, unquote. Actors. Right, and I'm a Shakespearean actor. Richard Crenna played the ill-fated husband, Edmund Walker. Crenna was first covered in the space drama Maroon, 1969. William Hurt played Ned Racine, Hurt was born in D.C. in 1950. During high school, he was in several school plays. He began studying theology at Tufts University, but switched to acting at Juilliard. He began performing on stage and was quite successful. After some television, he made a big splash with the strange movie Altered States 1980. He hit again as the not-so-innocent victim in Body Heat 1981. He was terrific again in The Big Chill 1983 as a drug-dealing friend, for a time, every movie he made was a big deal, including Gorky Park, 1983, Kiss of the Spider Woman, 1985, where he was nominated for a Best Actor Oscar, Children of a Lesser God, 1986, where Hurt was again nominated for a Best Actor Oscar, Broadcast News, 1987, where he was again nominated for a Best Actor Oscar, and The Accidental Tourist, 1988. Other good movies include Lost in Space, 1998, the Village 2004, A History of Violence 2005, Captain America Civil War 2016, Avengers Infinity War 2018, and Avengers Endgame 2019. Hurt is still acting. Kathleen Turner played femme fatale Maddie Walker. Turner was born in Missouri in 1954. She graduated from the American School in London in 1972. She returned to the U.S. and began studying at Missouri State University but received her Bachelor of Fine Arts from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, in 1977. Turner is listed as an alumnus of the Central School of Speech and Drama in London, but the dates are not specified. Turner's first film role was Body Heat, 1981, where her husky voice and sexy acting made her an instant star. She was great as writer Joan Wilder in Romancing the Stone, 1984, and in The Inferior, The Jewel of the Nile, 1985. Other films include Pritzi's Honor 1985, Peggy Sue Got Married 1986, which was pretty darn good with Nicolas Cage and Leon Ames, who framed Roger Rabbit 1988 as the sexy voice of Jessica Rabbit, The War of the Roses 1989, V.I. Warchowski 1991, 
Undercover Blues 1993, and Serial Mom 1994. Health and drinking derailed her career for a time, but by 2000 she was working again. Other actors include Ted Danson as Peter Lowenstein. Danson is probably best known for his role on the television show Cheers 1982-93. Mickey Rourke, who had a small part in this film and I will cover in the future episode Angel Heart 1987, played arsonist Teddy Lewis. J.A. Preston played Oscar Grace. He is best known as the judge that shut down Jack Nicholson in A Few Good Men, 1992. Story. Let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. Ned Racine, William Hurt, is a small-time lawyer in a small southern coastal town. He has been sued for malpractice after he messed up someone's will, getting by and sleeping with the local waitresses. He is a good friend with the assistant prosecutor, Peter Lowenstein, Ted Danson. After barely getting a client off, Sounds that perhaps when I presented all the evidence... Yeah, yeah, it... yeah. Listen, if I were you, I would recommend to your client that he quickly do as Mr. Lowenstein here has suggested. Plead no low contendra, file chapter 11, and agree never to do business with Okilanta County again. Ned and Peter go to a local cafe. The heat wave is weighing on everyone. Ned drinks in the local bar looking for something or someone to get involved with. He goes to an outdoor concert and he sees an amazingly beautiful woman wearing all white. He approaches her and tries to start a conversation. The woman says she is married. He follows her for a while and they make small talk. The woman lets out that her husband is out of town and only around on the weekends. At her request, he buys her a cherry snow cone. Ned deduces that she is from Pine Haven. Ned makes a good joke and she spills the cone on her dress. She reveals her name is Maddie, Kathleen Turner, and then asks if he wants to lick the stain off. Oh, nice move, Maddie. Maddie, I like it. It's right over your heart. At least it's cool. I was burning up. I actually have to talk about the heat. Would you get me a paper towel or something? Dip it in some cold water? Right away, I'll even wipe it off for you. You don't want to lick it? He goes to get her a paper towel, and when he returns, Maddie is gone. Ned begins to spend the evenings prowling Pine Haven and other locations where Maddie might be. One night, Ned finds Maddie in a Pine Haven bar. What are you doing in Pine Haven? I'm no yokel. I was all the way to Miami once. There are some men, once they get a whiff of it, they trail you like a hound. I'm not that eager. They finally share names. Maddie's body temperature is around 100 degrees, hence the title of the movie. Maddie decides to let Ned follow her home. As a cover, she slaps Ned and walks away. Ned follows her to the house and it's a large estate on the water. In a bit of foreshadowing, Ned notices the boathouse in the distance. Maddie tells Ned to leave. She kisses him at the front door, leaving him confused. He sees her waiting inside and breaks a glass door with a plant. They begin kissing and make passionate sex. Ned returns to his dull life as a lawyer. Ned returns to Maddie during the week and they turn the boathouse into a love nest. Maddie is cautious and has even started smoking the same brand of cigarettes as Ned. Peter meets Ned in the cafe and the time frame has been a month. Their old friend, police detective Oscar Grace, J.A. Preston, joins them as well. Ned won't tell them who he has been seeing. Oscar says the heat is causing more crime. Ned continues to visit Maddie and they continue to have a steamy relationship. Maddie starts telling Ned that she hates her mean husband. Ned is now lost when he can't see Maddie, although he does sport a Florida State University shirt when he goes running. He spies on the house, and Maddie's husband, Edmund Walker, Richard Crenna, has his car parked out front. Later, Ned shows up at the estate and sees a woman wearing a white dress standing in the gazebo. He crudely asks her for sex, and it's not Maddie. Hey, lady, you want to f***? Gee, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> this sure is a friendly town. I'm sorry. You are. You mean the offer's no good? Maddie comes out and introduces the new woman as Mary Ann, Kim Zimmer, as Maddie hands her an envelope. Mary Ann says she is just passing through. Maddie says Mary Ann is an old friend and only wants her to be happy. Later, Maddie tells Ned about Edmund's will. She says she wants Edmund dead. Ned's two lives continue. When he is with Maddie the next time, 
She says she has signed a prenup and won't get much money if she divorces Edmund. In another homage to the film noir genre, Maddie gifts Ned a gray fedora. Edmund comes home and he brings his niece to stay with Maddie for a week. Ned is crushed that he can't see Maddie and spends time throwing his fedora on the hat stand. One night, while the niece is still there, Ned shows up at the estate. The child walks in on them while they are in flagrante delecto. The mother picks the child up on Thursday and Maddie is distraught. One night, Ned walks into a restaurant and runs into Maddie and Edmund. Edmund invites him to join them. They talk about work and Edmund says he buys beach property for investments. Edmund talks about infidelity, Maddie's ex, business, and being a little shady. She's something, isn't she? Oh, <laughs> she's a lovely lady. Yeah. yeah, she is. And I'm crazy about her. If I thought she was seeing another guy, I don't know. Oh, I could understand how it could happen. Her being the way she is, I could understand it, but I think I'd kill the guy with my bare hands. It's understanding. <laughs> Another day, Ned checks out an old beach restaurant that Edmund owns. When he goes into his office, Maddie is waiting there. She asks to be held and says Edmund had left that morning. They confirm that they cannot use phones to communicate. Ned tells Maddie that they are going to kill Edmund. You have to be very careful now about the phones. Why, Ned? Why do you say this now? account for a couple of calls. We've had some contact. It would make sense. Why, Ned? What's happened? Kill him. We both know that. That's what you want, isn't it? He says with the right will, Maddie will get half of everything. Ned begins to case the property Edmund owns. When Ned and Maddie meet again, she tells him that half of the money will go to the niece. She wants to change the will and have Ned do it. He is against it. Ned goes to see one of his old clients. Teddy Lewis, Mickey Rourke, who will be covered in Angel Heart 1987. Teddy shows Ned how to make a timer and make an arson fire. Maddie is waiting in the car and knows where the arson expert is located. Lewis advises Ned about not being a criminal. And I want to ask you something. Are you listening to me? Because I like you. I got a serious question for you. What the f are you doing? This is nice shit for you to be messing with. Are you ready to hear something? I want you to see if this sounds familiar. Anytime you try a decent crime, you got 50 ways you can fuck up. If you think it's 25 at end, then you're a genius. And you ain't no genius. You remember who told me that? Ned and Maddie meet again for sex and put the final details on the murder plan. Ned travels to Miami and gets a hotel room to establish his alibi. He sees a clown driving a classic red car and freaks out a little. Maddie has to make love with Edmund to keep him on schedule. Ned drives back up in a rental car. Edmund hears something downstairs and goes down with his gun drawn. Maddie yells, he has a gun, and Ned jumps out of the closet. The two men fight, and Ned eventually clubs Edmund to death. Ned wraps up the body and takes it to the beach property that is owned by Edmund. He uses Edmund's car. Ned almost gets killed a few times in the fog. He takes the body inside and unwraps it. Ned sets the arson bomb to go off. The plan is to make it look like Edmund was trying to burn his building and died when a timber failed. Maddie picks him up outside in his rental car, and when he drops her off, he says they cannot talk for a long while. He drives back to Miami. The bomb goes off, later destroying the evidence. Sometime later, a Miami lawyer calls Ned about Edmund and the new will that they say Ned wrote. Of course, Maddie is the one that made the changes. Maddie knows that if the will is invalid, she will get all the money. Ned goes to meet the other lawyers, Edmund's sister, Maddie, and Peter. The signing of the fake will was alleged to be witnessed by Ned and Mary Ann. Mary Ann is not available. The phony will that Maddie made has a bad in perpetuity clause and is invalid as far as the niece inheriting her half of the money. The Miami lawyer says the judge caught Ned's mistake and says that Ned has been sued before. Ned and Maddie have words outside about the fake will, and she invites him to the house that night. When Ned gets back to his room, Peter and Oscar are waiting for him. Oscar asks about Edmund's death. He says Maddie is poison. 
Oscar says also that there is no record of Marianne leaving the country. They tell him to stay away from Maddie. He says he can't stay away because she has started coming on to him. Oscar warns Ned again before the two men leave. Ned, you've messed up before and you'll mess up again. It's your nature. But they've always been small time. But this might not be. She's trouble, that real thing, big time major league trouble. Watch yourself. After the next sexual encounter, Maddie tells that she had a misspent youth and was into drugs. She said a lawyer helped clean her up, and that is where she learned about the law. He tells her that the cops think she may have committed the murder. The aunt brings the niece into the police station. Oscar is questioning Ned about his trip to Miami. Peter says Edmund's glasses are missing from the murder scene. They think that Edmund was murdered someplace else and brought to the site of the fire. Oscar says that the niece has reported that she saw Maddie with a man. Ned looks a little shaken. Oscar says Ned can sneak out the back, but he walks out the front way and goes straight to the end. He introduces himself to the niece. Slick move. Peter later tells that the niece only saw the penis that night and not Ned's face. Ned rages on Maddie about Edmund's missing glasses. Maddie lures him back in with the promise of the money. I don't know what to think. I'm worried, Ned. But it's not about the glasses or your friends. It's us. Your first reaction is to accuse me. What's happening to you? I'm sorry. Soon it will be all ours. That's why we've got to stay together, Ned. It won't be long, and then we can get away from here, out from under all of this. All we have is each other. I'd kill myself if I thought this thing would destroy us. Oscar goes to Miami and checks Ned's reservations, phone log, car rental, valet, and exit paths. Peter is dancing like Fred Astaire on the pier when Ned comes in from his run. Peter says he doesn't care who killed Edmund and who gets rich from it. Oscar has found Mary Ann's place, but not her. Peter says someone is putting him in trouble because the night of the murder, someone repeatedly called Ned's hotel room in Miami, destroying his alibi. He also says someone is negotiating with the police to turn over Edmund's glasses. Ned goes on another trip to Miami. While he is in a bar, he runs into a lawyer that was part of the suit against him. The lawyer mentions that he told Maddie, a year or so before, about Ned and the lawsuit over the messed up will. Ned can't find Maddie, and the next day he finds out that Teddy, the arsonist, is in jail. Teddy doesn't know why he was picked up. Teddy tells Ned that Maddie had come to him for another arson bomb that can be wired to a door. The cops have also been asking Teddy about the fire where Edmund's body burned. Finally, Maddie calls Ned at his office. Maddie has gotten the money and stashed it somewhere safe. She says that the maid has the glasses and has been paid to leave them in the boathouse. Ned goes to the boathouse that night and sees the wire for the bomb. Oscar and Peter are sick about having to arrest Ned, who they now believe is guilty. Ned goes into the house and removes Edmund's gun. Oscar goes to arrest Ned at his house, but he is not there. Ned waits in the gazebo at Maddie's house, unsure of the next move. Finally, Maddie returns, driving Edmund's Cadillac car. Maddie sticks to her story and says she loves Ned. What is it, Ned? What's happened? I think you know. No, I swear I don't. It's the glasses, Maddie. Oh, were they there? Didn't you bring them? I didn't see them. She promised me she would bring them. Maybe I missed them. The way you missed them that night. Ned, I don't know what you're thinking, but you're wrong. I could never do anything to hurt you. I love you. You've got to believe that. Keep talking, Maddie. Experience shows I can be convinced of anything. Oscar comes to the estate. Ned tells Maddie to go get the glasses from the boathouse. I did arrange to meet you, Ned. But that all changed. You changed it. I fell in love with you. I didn't plan that. You never quit, do you? You just keep on coming. How can I prove it to you? What can I say? Oscar sees the pair in the distance. Maddie walks to the boathouse, proclaiming her love for Ned. He drops the gun and runs after Maddie. The boathouse explodes. Later, in prison, Ned wakes up and realizes that Maddie is alive. Oscar comes to see him so he can explain that the body in the boathouse was Mary Ann. But Oscar says the dental records match Maddie Walker. Found a body in the boathouse. 
What if that was somebody else's body in the boathouse? What if it was already there when I got there, dead and waiting for me? Maybe her friend, Marianne. Her teeth were left, man. I was saying about the other night, the identification was positive. Ned continues that the woman they know as Maddie is really Mary Ann. Mary Ann had been blackmailing the fake Maddie, hence the envelope exchange earlier. The fake Maddie killed Mary Ann, who is the real Maddie. Fake Maddie left real Maddie in the boathouse. Fake Maddie pulled the door to set the bomb delay and swam away from the boathouse. Oscar doesn't buy the story, even though they have not found the money. Another day in prison, Ned gets the 1968 yearbook from Wheaton High School in Illinois. He sees a picture of the woman he met as Mary Ann under the name Maddie Walker. Under the name Mary Ann Simpson, he sees a picture of the woman he knew as Maddie. Her ambition is listed as to be rich and live in an exotic land. The last scene shows the wealthy Mary Ann Simpson, fake Maddie, laying on a tropical beach when an unseen male says to her in Portuguese that it is hot. So we assume they are living in Brazil. What? Oh, no. Will she kill again? I'll be right back with the conclusions in the world famous short summary following a word from our sponsors. Summary. After watching this movie, it's pretty clear that it's a souped up version of Double Indemnity 1944. Many sources have noted this point. Today's film was released 37 years after Double Indemnity 1944. Richard Crenna, who was the victim Edmund, played the Walter Neff role in the horrible Double Indemnity 1973. In Turner's second film role, a comedy titled The Man with Two Brains 1983, she played a femme fatale character that spoofed Maddie Walker. Kathleen Turner, in her first role, Body Heat 1981, has been compared favorably to the fantastic Lauren Bacall in her first movie, To Have and Have Not, 1944. Both actresses were noted for the incredibly sexy role that they played that included a deep, sensual voice, Turner's was better, long legs, and a tall, slim body. These two films made both of these women big stars. World-famous short summary, I did it for the money, and I did it for the woman. I didn't get the money, and I didn't get the woman. Hope you enjoyed today's show. You can find connections to social media and email on the site at classicmovierev.com or in the podcast show notes. If you enjoyed this show, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. If you've already subscribed, you can tell a friend, colleague, or family member about the show or leave a review at Apple Podcast. It really helps the show get found. If you want to comment, suggest a movie, or help out, contact me by email at jec at classicmovierev.com. Beware the Moors.